For lawyers, needless to say, the protests and the responses to them raise a whole range of questions. On Friday, one of my colleagues, Professor Larissa Katz, who is also one of our panelists here today, made the excellent suggestion that we convene a SNAP panel, as she called it, i.e. do it quickly, of colleagues to consider various aspects of the Freedom Convoy phenomenon. Now, of course, lawyers don't have all the answers, but law is implicated in a whole range of ways. The protesters are asserting freedoms, not just to protest, but also, among other things, to be free from vaccine mandates and other public health measures. Our focus today is not so much on the latter set of extremely important issues around which colleagues are actually also organizing events, but we're focused on the protest phenomenon as such. How far does the freedom to protest go? What happens when it bumps up against other freedoms? For example, the freedom to move about one's city unimpeded or the freedom to enjoy one's home or property undisturbed. What are the parameters for government action, for policing? How do we make sense of the protests and the responses to them in the context of our constitutional culture, including our federal system? What of the recourse to emergency powers? And finally, Non-governmental actors also regulate freedom, social media and platforms, where do they fit? How should they be regulated? How can they be regulated, given that their operations and users straddle jurisdiction? So endless questions, we can't address them all, but we can make a start. And so as to have as many angles as possible, we've asked each speaker to be very brief, eight minutes. And I should also say that as the Dean of the Faculty of Law, I'm in a sense basking in reflected glory because I was parachuted into the moderator role, but I really had very little to do with the organization of this event because when Professor Katz wrote with the idea last Friday, Professor Brenda Cosman spun into action literally and over the weekend pulled together the amazing panel of speakers we have here today. So thank you, Brenda, and thank you colleagues for being here today. I now just want very briefly to introduce each of our panelists in the alphabetical order in which they will speak and they will then pass the baton from one to the other um, as they um, um, offer their remarks. So beginning with Professor Chris Essert, he's our Associate Dean JD program and in his spare time, a private law scholar, notably property and tort theory. Professor Gillian Hatfield is the inaugural Schwartz Reisman Chair in Technology and Society. Professor of Law and Professor of Strategic Management, the Director of the Schwartz Riesman Institute for Technology and Society, and among many other things, she uh, works on technical innovation, AI, and law. Professor Larissa Katz holds the Canada Research Chair in Private Law Theory. She writes about moral, political, and social issues relating to private law generally, and property law in particular. Professor Anthony Niblett holds the Canada Research Chair in Law, Economics and Innovation, and his research focuses, not surprisingly, on law and economics, innovation contracts, judicial behavior and competition policy. Arthur Ripstein is university professor at, at, here at U of T and the inaugural holder of the Howard Beck QC Chair. He is an authority on torts, legal theory, political philosophy and Kant. Professor Kent Roach is a prolific scholar and leading voice on national security and anti-terrorism law, constitutional law, and criminal law. Professor David Schneiderman writes and teaches on Canadian constitutional law, including federalism and the charter, as well as constitutionalism and globalization. And finally, Professor Richard Stacey works and teaches on public law and is particularly interested in how governments and their agents uphold and fulfill constitutional commitment. So we have a formidable panel, and I will pass um, the floor to Professor Essert. Chris, please. Thanks, uh, Jutta, and thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about the law of private nuisance as it applies to the uh, facts of the convoy. So let me say by way of introduction that I teach both uh, property law and tort law, as the dean mentioned, and I teach nuisance law in both of those uh, classes. And I try to convince my students uh, that it's an exciting and dynamic area of the law, although I think they don't think that coming into law school, and maybe some of them think it after I finish teaching it, but uh, we'll see. In any event, uh, one element of these protests that's been very fascinating for me has been the way in which this uh, relatively old-fashioned part of private law has come to the fore and played actually a pretty important role in uh, at least part of what's happened so far. So let me let me say a little bit about it. 
The law of nuisance is, uh, roughly speaking, um, and often kind of colloquially referred to as the law of neighbors. It's the law that uh, governs the relationships between neighboring owners of land or of real property. Um, roughly speaking, the law says something like that each person shouldn't use their property in any way that unreasonably interferes with the use and enjoyment of their neighbor's property. So there's a lot to say about the law of nuisance as it as it works in the abstract. But notice that the first thing I said about it is that it is normally said to apply to the relationships between two neighbors of land. That said, when we talk about nuisance, a thing that we usually say, often by reference to kind of fanciful hypotheticals, is something like that the tort could also apply to somebody who is unreasonably interfering with your use and enjoyment of your own property, not while they're on property of their own, but instead while they're um, on the public streets. So I know that I'm not alone amongst torts professors in giving examples of, you know, an ice cream truck that drives around the block over and over again, incessantly blaring the ice cream truck song. So one, you know, interesting dynamic in the uh, protests in Ottawa has been the, uh, an illustration of one of the, you know, great features of the common law, which is that we actually often don't need hypotheticals because we have a real actual fact situation that's in some sense more absurd than the ones that we could think of. So as everybody probably remembers, for the first week or so of the protests, uh, the trucks in Ottawa spent the uh, al almost all day and all night uh, with their horns honking. The statement of claim filed by the class action lawsuit uh, that I'll talk about in a minute refers to an, um, an incessant blaring of high decibel car, car truck and air horns. So what was going on in Ottawa was that these truck horns were blaring at a volume that was by all accounts so loud as to be effectively uh, unbearable to make it impossible for people to sleep or to go about their day-to-day -day lives. So here we have one of these problems where um, somebody is doing something that's actually not on their own property, but, but while driving around on public property, on the public streets, making an amount of noise that as the statement of claim uh, alleges, constituted an unreasonable interference with the use and enjoyment of the property of the people who lived in the neighborhood, who live in the neighborhood uh, where the pro protests are taking place. So there's a lot to say about how the law of nuisance applies in cases like this. As I say, um, the basic rule is that you can't do something that unreasonably interferes with the use and enjoyment of somebody else's land. But of course, all of the interesting work is in the question of determining what counts as an unreasonable interference with somebody else's uh, use and enjoyment of their land. And there's two dynamics here that are worth talking about in this context. One of them is a familiar one in the context of nuisance law, which is to say that what, whether or not an interference like a noise uh, in particular counts as an unreasonable interference will be a matter of a bunch of factors, things like how loud the noise is, things like how often it happens, things like how long it lasts. And there's all kinds of cases throughout the history of the common law that uh, go into a lot of detail about the questions just like that, really contextual, factual questions about what kind of thing a person should have to uh, put up with. Because another element of the law of nuisance that's quite relevant here is that one way in which we think about whether or not something is an unreasonable interference is whether or not it can be uh, thought of as not an unreasonable interference, but rather instead a matter of give and take, live and let live. The idea that when we live in a, uh, a crowded urban environment, such as Toronto or Ottawa, we often are expected to put up with the effects of others' use of their property, the noises that they make, the smells that they generate. Uh, and so the question is whether or not a noise is one that is the kind of thing that you ought to put up with, like when your neighbors have a party in their backyard one weekend, or whether instead it rises far beyond that level and, uh, as the law says, constitutes an unreasonable interference. A second dynamic, uh, one that's a little bit less developed in the case law, but of course is extremely relevant here, is the question of the extent to which we might want to integrate into our private law reasoning and nuisance law, things like charter values. So a lot of people think, and I'm sympathetic to the view that whether or not something is an unreasonable interference might depend on whether or not it's a kind of form of protected expression. I might be expected to put up with uh, somebody's expressing uh, their views through speech in a way that I might not be expected to put up with the exact same volume and duration of noise if it's non-expressive noise, right? So just something like a lawnmower or a, um, um, a chainsaw or other kind of noisy activity. 
So of course that's present here too, because I take it that there's in some sense uh, at least a plausible or colorable claim that the horns are meant to be a form of expression, although I'll leave that to the constitutional lawyers in the room if they want to say anything about that. So all that said, what we're, what we're presented with is actually a really core, straightforward private nuisance claim, namely the idea that the, the blaring of the horns is so loud as to constitute an unreasonable interference with the use and enjoyment of the property of the residents of the neighborhood. And so the the... Uh, the class action statement of claim that was filed last week relies on this uh, on this idea as one of its central planks. And in fact, the uh, Superior Court in Ottawa was prepared to grant a, a preliminary injunction on the basis of, I think, that very thing. And one of the effects of that injunction was the, uh, the cessation of the honking. And I think the, the upshot of that injunction is allowing us to see that even though we might think that there are important expressive values involved in some cases of nuisance, if your expression arises to the level of, again, incessant blaring of high decibel horns that make living in the neighborhood essentially impossible, then we're very clearly in the realm of an unreasonable interference in the use and enjoyment of land. So I was quite pleased to just return to the very first point I made uh, to, to see that this, uh, you know, apparently ancient and outdated part of the common law was able to come to the fore and play a kind of a heroic role at the uh, stage of the interlocutory injunction to get that to, to at least get the horns to stop. And by, again, all accounts, that had a, a huge impact on um, on the quality of life of the people in the neighborhood. So I'll leave it there because I know there's lots of other things that people want to say. Um, thanks very much. I'll turn it over to Jillian. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, so it, it, Chris has given a perspective through the lens he's bringing to this and emphasizing the, the connection between what's happening and, you know, very, very old, longstanding problems for humans living together about, you know, neighbors and relations and noise and so on. And I want to talk about the lens that I'm bringing, which is thinking about how our legal and regulatory infrastructure is adapting to um, a, you know, very transformed uh, world, the digital economy and uh, digital platforms and how we think about uh, these issues today. What I spend my time thinking about a lot these days is whether or not our legal and regulatory infrastructure is, is up to snuff to handle the world of rapid innovation, AI, globalization, and so on. And the short answer is no, it's not. We need to do some reinventing. But this, this turn, uh, the, the convoy type turns out to be a, a great uh, sort of little, little mini uh, masterclass in the issues that, that we're facing. And I should say that, that when I was asked to participate in this panel on the weekend, the story at that point was uh, the, the fact that the GoFundMe uh, platform uh, that had been used to fund uh, millions of dollars and to support the, uh, the, the participants in, in the protest. So that's supporting people on things like, you know, if they're not working, right? Supporting them for, for the time that they're not actually driving those trucks or supporting, uh, providing food or security, fuel and so on, uh, transportation, all of those things. So that was funded uh, uh, initially on a, uh, a, a platform, a, a crowdfunding platform, the GoFundMe platform. Um, and the story as I said on the weekend was that the GoFundMe platform, which is a private company uh, that's operating um, sort of at a global level. That's another way in which it's got access from kind of anyone who can access the platform. Uh, made a decision to end the uh, to, to stop funneling those funds to the uh, protesters, um, and said that they did so on the basis of contract law. That anybody who had clicked the little box who had come to the GoFundMe platform had clicked that they were not funding anything that uh, 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 promotes violence or harassment. So this private corporation made the determination to cut off the funding to, uh, to the protests uh, in reliance on saying, this is in violation of our terms and conditions. So that's a private determination that this is not an end to which we want to provide our private platform. And this is something, of course, that we're seeing uh, throughout the digital economy. Every single one of you has probably clicked 12 times today already on one of the little boxes. Did you read the terms and conditions? Of course you didn't read the terms and conditions. I'm a contracts professor. I don't read the terms and conditions and it wouldn't matter if I did. We click, click, click. We're deciding all kinds of things about how our data is used, um, 
you know, things like where could our money go? Uh, GoFundMe made a determination initially that it was going to refund some of the amounts of money and then direct uh, other parts of the money to charities chosen by uh, participants, uh, funders, then under protest said, okay, we'll just send it back to everybody. Uh, that's all private decision making that's happening there. So we've, we're doing that all the time. Tons of the structure of our digital environment, our AI systems are being decided by through these private mechanisms. And as we've seen with platforms like Facebook and, and recent um, you know, disclosures around like for, with Francis Haugen, the whistleblower at, at, at Facebook, uh, bringing out information. We have platforms that today, these privately owned corporations that are performing this really big public role, making determinations of what's an appropriate use of this infrastructure, this transactional financing infrastructure. Now, as I said, that was the story on, uh, on the weekend when I said I would talk about this on, uh, on the panel. That's what makes this a SNAP panel. Next thing that happens is we have the Emergencies Act, which actually now has the government coming in and saying a public decision. We are not going to allow our financial institutions and infrastructure, uh, one, to be used to, to fund illegal activity. And we are now making that determination of what counts as, as illegal activity. And in fact, we're going to recruit the resources of our financial institutions, our banks and so on to monitor, identify, interrupt and report on transactions uh, that appear suspicious from the point of view of supporting what we're deeming uh, illegal activity. Now, what's interesting about that is, as I said, in the, the world of social media, we are talking a lot about, is this the right place for these decisions to be made? You know, Why is Mark Zuckerberg deciding what the line is between uh, free speech and uh, hate speech, or how much risk we want to expose teenage girls to of, of you know, um, mental health challenges and so on. Like that, that's not a function that private corporations should be performing. Mark Zuckerberg has actually also said things like, we're really more like a government than a corporation now. Well, is that what we want? And so part of the story, thinking about the modern economy and society and, and the digital transformation is thinking about, okay, how do we reinvent that? And what's really striking about, uh, uh, about the protest, uh, I think, is the fact that now we're actually seeing what it means for a government to say, no, this is actually for us to decide. And it's done in a politically accountable way. It's done in a public way. We're having debates. You can read it in the newspaper, you read it on social media, people who say they shouldn't be invoking the Emergencies Act, we'll have debates about what it means. We'll have banks that are saying in a public way, uh, you know, uh, what their participation is. We'll have freedom of information opportunities to, to gain access to, to how this is being handled. And again, that public disclosure and vetting of the decisions by politically accountable, accountable actors. So I think that's a really uh, fascinating uh, piece of what we're, we're seeing um, uh, with, with this activity. It's, it's incredibly current. Uh, I spent all my time thinking about how to make this invisible role of, of law and this rich, rich infrastructure more visible, more aware, because I think we take for granted that we're in a position to respond to all the challenges we see in the modern uh, world. Uh, and, and I think, as I said at the outset, I think we have a lot of reinventing uh, to do on that score, but I think it's a, it's a so it's just a really nice uh, example of the kinds of challenges and the ways in which we perhaps need to figure out how to get more of those decisions into the public sector, which we are seeing here. It's interesting. I'll pass it on to, let's see, who's after me? Is it Larissa? Larissa, yes. Thank you, Jillian. Larissa. Well, thank you for everyone for uh, for joining us today and for listening to, uh, to me speak anyway. I, I'm very delighted to have that opportunity. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about forfeiture powers, uh, a, a sort of a special kind of power that the state has that I think uh, engages the state in a very different kind of relationship with its citizens. So when we think about how the law responds to unlawful activity, we tend to think about what the law demands of us as individuals and how it holds us as individuals responsible for wrongdoing. So we think, in other words, of relations between individuals and the state, relations between individuals and other individuals, uh, we think in terms of relations that are in persona, that are with respect to people. But as it turns out, there's a lot more to law and a lot more to government powers 
than government individual relations. Governments, as it turns out, uh, also have this special categories of relationship that is direct with respect to things. So provincial governments have extensive powers in REM. In REM meaning, of course, with respect to things themselves, powers in relation to things directly. And these powers are set out uh, in civil forfeiture statutes like Ontario's Civil Remedies Act uh, and are held across this country and of course across the USA and other common law jurisdictions besides. These powers in REM allow government to proceed directly against a thing that is tainted by unlawful activity, sidestepping the people involved in the activity and so entire, the entire criminal justice system as well. And notice that the taint that attracts these powers in REM follows the thing, wherever it might be, even if the unlawful activity happens elsewhere, outside the jurisdiction. So forfeiture power is very much in the background of the convoy. So Stephen Del Duca has called on uh, Premier Ford, for instance, to use these forfeiture powers to seize, for instance, the trucks and uh, potentially much more besides. So just take the trucks. Uh, so the trucks, as we know, these big rigs, but also pickup trucks are, you know, themselves being used as, as leverage in the convoy, the sheer size, the near impossibility of moving them, the noise, as Chris has described, the pollution they're able to emit, their capacity to cause bodily harm, as we saw in Coots, Alberta, where one of these trucks, uh, you know, apparently, uh, you know, started to move toward a police officer. So all of these features make these things effective instruments of what, what appears or is said to be an illegal blockade. And of course, beyond these trucks, there's of course money too, as Jillian has addressed, funds used to maintain that blockade that may be tainted uh, then by unlawful activity. Now, to be clear, the things themselves, the trucks, may not be being used in this way by their owners. Indeed, we've seen on the news that some trucking companies uh, are reporting their dismay at seeing their trucks being used as instruments of blockade. And they have expressed their concern. In other cases, of course, we do have uh, owner operators uh, bringing their, their rigs and other, other vehicles uh, to the blockade. So what I wanna do in, in the brief time I have with you is just to provide some context for understanding civil forfeiture powers and why they may not be the most appropriate tools in this context, although they are available. So the first thing is to keep in mind how these are different from other powers government has in respect of things. So the power, as we saw over the weekend with the Emergency Act, the power to conscript private property. Uh, towing companies, for instance, can be conscripted to uh, use their towing trucks to remove uh, the trucks that are in the blockades. The power, of course, to expropriate with just compensation is another power government has that affects things, powers to tax, powers to regulate. All of these powers, of course, affect things, but forfeiture, as a kind of power in REM is different from all of these other powers. So forfeiture and a forfeiture order, of course, has the effect of subordinating the interests of others with respect to a thing to the government's right. It prioritizes the government's right to a thing to the exclusion of others. So that's the effect of a forfeiture order. So where we might wanna think of government as the owner of a last resort, with the owner having prior and better rights and the government just stepping in if the thing is left vacant or uh, you know, um, it is streets in some sense, or it's no one who's eligible to hold office of ownership anymore. In fact, forfeiture flips that priority, putting the government first in a chain of title in circumstances where a forfeiture order um, is determined to be appropriate by a court. Historically, the power to proceed in REM with respect to things themselves allowed governments to go after things that were used in violation of maritime or customs laws, even in situations where governments lack jurisdiction over the people involved, well, especially in situations where governments lack that jurisdiction. So civil forfeiture took off in the USA following uh, liquor prohibitions in the 1920s. Uh, in Canada, it came much later. So uh, following 9-11 in the 2000s, early 2000s, uh, there was a wave of civil forfeiture acts uh, across the country. Um, um, and uh, to the point that now every province has uh, some version of uh, Ontario's Civil Forfeiture Act. Now, Civil Forfeiture Acts look a little like or are close relatives of criminal forfeiture uh, provided for in the criminal code, but it's really different from that too. So it's available, civil forfeiture powers, powers in REM, are available to the government even in the absence of any conviction of any crime, even in the absence of any charges being laid. The connection between a thing and the unlawful activity that taints it 
does not depend on identifying the person involved, let alone charging them. So the government's power to act in REM in this sense is not subject to the same constraints as its power to act in persona with respect to people. So considerations of proportionality, culpability, procedural protections, criminal laws, heightened burden of proof, not factors in civil forfeiture. And the theory, of course, is that questions of personal responsibility are for some other area of law, for the criminal law. And that's not what we're doing here. So how does it work? In a, in a civil forfeiture proceeding, the attorney general is asking the court uh, to make a determination, to determine that a thing is either the proceeds of or the instruments of unlawful activity, and that forfeiture is not clearly contrary to the interests of justice. So in cases where things are alleged to be the proceeds of a crime, there are defenses. There's the defense of the uninvolved interest holder, right, which allows uh, someone with a property right to say, look, I'm not involved. Um, and uh, there's uh, no reason of justice not to make accommodation for my rights here. But where the thing is an instrument of unlawful activity, and I imagine here in the context of the convoy, that would be the allegation that's being made. You know, there's a, a different kind of defense altogether that I think is quite revealing about the relationship between state and owners, and that is the responsible owner defense. So where someone, like say a trucking company, not involved in the convoy, wishes to, uh, you know, in effect, defend against a forfeiture order, what they're required to show is that they have exhausted their powers to prevent the use of their thing to advance someone else's unlawful agenda. They're in control, in other words, right? They're exercising the normative powers available to them, but of course not those powers not available to them, like, for example, coercion and self-help. Constitutionally, of course, Ontario's civil forfeiture legislature has uh, withstood challenge in the Chatterjee case in 2009, but that was in respect of uh, a claim uh, to money seized as proceeds of unlawful activity, uh, a, a challenge brought by someone who was never charged with an offence in relation to the money or any drug activity. The Supreme Court of Canada upheld the constitutionality of the Civil Remedies Act and allowed that provinces, which bear the costs of unlawful activity, uh, should be allowed to have deterrence of unlawful activity as a legitimate purpose, uh, you know, within their jurisdiction over property and civil rights. It's not as clear that the forfeiture of the instruments of unlawful activity serve that same provincial purpose in deterring crime in just the same way. Uh, we don't have time here to talk about Bentham. He had elaborate views about why forfeiture really didn't work as deterrence, and that might be something that is worth thinking about uh, insofar as uh, there's ever a challenge uh, to um, the constitutionality uh, of this aspect of the civil forfeitures uh, legislation in Ontario. So what's the rationale? In my view, the basic rationale, and I'm just gonna close on this point uh, for civil forfeiture powers, is that the state backstops owner's authority to set lawful agendas for things and stands as the owner of last resort for agendaless things. A thing without a lawful agenda is in effect an agendaless thing, justifying the state stepping in. So it's not a punitive move, it's a move to ensure the integrity of property rights by ensuring someone is in charge of things such that they do not become a loki of uh, unlawful activity undermining the blueprint for our lives together set out elsewhere in the law, in criminal law, and in constitutional law more generally. So last sentence, I know I'm out of time. Quite simply, for policy reasons, this may not be the best place to exercise these extraordinary powers. While unlawful activity that clearly undermines social blueprint uh, may taint a thing such that we need the state to step in, unlawful activity mixed up with the exercise of other rights and freedoms may not be a sufficient basis for justifying the exercise of these powers in REM with respect to things being used in the convoys. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Larissa. I'll pass it over to Anthony. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Yuta, for putting this on. Hi, I'm Anthony Niblett. I've, um, I've been asked to speak today on uh, social media and misinformation. So let's take a step back. Where do these protests come from? And the, the putative spark is the, the vaccine mandate. And one might ask, well, where does vaccine hesitancy come from? And where does resistance to uh, good public health measures come from? And a concern that you commonly see banded around is that people are getting their misguided and unscientific beliefs from false information from what they read on social media, you know, Twitter, Facebook, 
YouTube, they are dumpster fires of misinformation and disinformation. And there are, there are two general questions that interest me um, as a legal academic. And the first one is, well, how much harm is social media actually responsible for? And secondly, if social media does cause harm, you know, what role does the law have to play here? And the first question you know, is an empirical question. To what extent does the false information that is on social media, to what extent is that causing the problem? Do, does social media cause the problem or is it really just a reflection of the problem? And that really goes to the question of, you know, where beliefs come from, you know, are people's minds these blank slates and then they read this uh, misinformation or disinformation on social media and that you know, forms these misguided beliefs, you know, if so, then, you know, you know, false information might cause harm. Um, false information that you see on social media might be causing the harm. You know, there's an alternative view that people have these sets of beliefs to begin with, and they come onto social media and they, they hunt out information that supports or confirms their, their, their starting points, their, their biases. And if that's true, then, you know, trying to censor false information, trying to stamp down on the false information probably isn't going to change people's thoughts. Now, it might still be harmful um, because, you know, people with these given beliefs are now exposed to larger networks of like-minded people, and that might solidify the beliefs or you know, radicalize the beliefs and people get trapped in this bubble. But as I say, that's an empirical question as to, you know, the extent of the problem, what extent do, do social media platforms actually cause this problem or whether they're just a reflection of a broader problem? That's the first question. The second question is, well, if they do cause harm, then what role should the law play? Um, and to be honest, I'm a little skeptical that law has too much of a role to play in dictating to social media companies what sort of organic content uh, should be forbidden and should be allowed, especially where the question is one of, you know, is this content true or false? You know, just as a bit of context, every minute, every minute there are half a million posts on Facebook. There are 400,000 posts on Twitter. There are 500 hours worth of video that gets uploaded onto YouTube. And trying to moderate that content uh, is extremely difficult. That's an awful lot of material. Um, and so these companies, they have you know, these machine learning algorithms that try and separate you know, harmful content from valuable content, but they are not perfect. These algorithms are not perfect. And there's no algorithm that can perfectly predict the truth. There's no algorithm that can predict perfectly truthful content. Language is highly contextual. True content could be highly misleading depending on how it's presented. Many countries around the world have tried to regulate what is uh, on social media in the form of holding them responsible for leaving up harmful content online. So Germany has legislation that holds social media platforms accountable for um, you know, hate speech and right-wing extremism. We've tried to make movements uh, in that direction here in Canada. And the, the, the goals are extraordinarily laudable. The objectives are extremely uh, laudable. But the way in which we've gone about it is rightly being criticized on the grounds that it's gonna result in uh, collateral censorship. That is too much valuable content, too much content that is not harmful will end up being taken down. There's a number of countries around the world that are actively trying to regulate misinformation and disinformation on social media. And especially when it comes to uh, holding social media companies liable or responsible for leaving up organic content that is misinformation. And, you know, and the goal here of all of these um, regimes, of the, these regulatory regimes, is you know, the promotion of public tranquility, the promotion of public order. And you look at the countries that are doing this, some of these are one party states, some of them are authoritarian states, you know, Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Singapore, China. You know, if we start going down this route in China, using the state apparatus to start dictating to social media platforms precisely what can and can't be published on the grounds of truth, I would be very concerned. I mean, promoting peace, order, and good government always laudable. The question is, how do you do that in a highly diverse society where the transmission of information is 
incredibly fast and incredibly cheap. And the, fund and the, the freedom of information is, is fundamental. Where you've got these imperfect algorithms, the concern for me is one of collateral censorship and um, you know, the line between moderation, moderation and censorship might not be as clear as one would hope. And uh, I will keep my comments there and I will hand over to Professor Arthur Ripstein. Thank you, Anthony. My name is Arthur Ripstein and I want to talk briefly about the tort of public nuisance, which is among one of the pleadings that led to the injunction that was granted with respect to the Ambassador Bridge in Windsor. And it's also highly relevant to understanding part of the legal context of the protests in Ottawa and the possible legal remedies for them. Chris talked to you about private nuisance. Private nuisance is a matter of interfering with a land, an owner or occupier of land's use and enjoyment of that land. Public nuisance is fundamentally different. It's not made up of an aggregate of private nuisances. And so the fact that there were hundreds of thousands of people in Ottawa disturbed by the same blaring horns doesn't make it a public nuisance. A public nuisance instead is an interference with a right that people have as members of the public. And the idea that you have a right as a member of the public is an idea that's very old in our legal tradition. The basic thought is that as a member of the public, there are certain things that you are allowed to do and certain things that other people must not interfere with you doing. Clearest case of it, indeed, historically the fundamental case, and there've been lots of attempts to broaden the range of things for which public an action and public nuisance can be brought, is passing and repassing on a public highway. The basic thought is that as a member of the public, each of us is entitled to come and go as we please, and that in particular, no other private person is allowed to prevent us from accessing the public highway. And so no one else is entitled to determine, for example, whether you leave your land, whether you get to come visit me or not. That should be something that as a member of the public is up to you rather than up to any other private person. Now, there've been lots of attempts in recent decades to expand the tort of public nuisance. Lots of people have try to use it as the basis for environmental litigation. This is not surprising because public nuisance gives private people a right of action with respect to things in which there is a public interest. And we can see this in the case of roads. And so there are traffic rules. Again, if you think about the protests in Ottawa, anything that would count as a public nuisance, anything that would count as interfering with the right of members of the public to pass and repass on public roads is almost certainly already some violation of either the Highway Traffic Act or some municipal bylaw. You're not allowed to park in the middle of the road. That's already prohibited. One of the things about the tort of public nuisance is that if the government is not dealing with some public problem, then a private person can bring an action in public nuisance. That's why it seems so inviting for environmental litigation, which many people think governments are not dealing with adequately. That's why it's also appealing in this context. The basic idea behind the right, behind the tort of public nuisance is that each of us, as I said, is entitled to come and go as we please. Two basic ways in which one person might interfere with someone else's right to come and go as they please. On the one hand, they might interfere by landlocking that person. The case in which one person actually makes it impossible for another person to leave their land, that's not an interference, that's not a private nuisance. It's not a private nuisance because it's not interfering with that person's use and enjoyment of their land. It's rather interfering with their public right to pass and repass. The other possibility is someone is able to leave their land but they are traveling on a public road and the public road or, and the earliest cases also involved navigable waterways is blocked by somebody else. It's an interference with your public right if you are unable to come and go as you please. Now, 
And this idea of you having a right to come and go as you please has as its correlate, of course, the duty that is incumbent on other people not to interfere with it. And the way to think about it is that your right to come and go as you please has to be the kind of right that you can have consistent with everyone else having the same right. And so that means that as you and I are traveling on the road going our, in our separate directions to our different locations, each of us is entitled to use the road for transport. We're not, for example, allowed to use the road for storage. There was actually an Australian case in the 1950s where a farmer dug up the road, plowed it and planted crops on it. You can't do that. Why? Because your life, your Everyone else's right to use the road is the limit on your license to use the road. Your license to use the road is a license to use it for passing and repassing. Now, if we think about it in those terms, then we can see that there's a limited range of things that ways in which you can use the road. We see also that among those limited range of things, using it for Travel and transport is obviously going to be the central one, but not the only one. And we see also that the specification of the ways in which you can and cannot use it is going to be largely a matter of positive statutory law. No parking between midnight and 7 a.m. That's just a legal restriction on the way in which you can use the, the road. And so you have a series of restrictions and permissions. One of the issues that comes up in the context of the convoy protest is whether using a road for protest is one of the normal uses of it. And there's not a lot of case law on this in Canada. In Canada, our law of tort is supposed to be made congruent with charter values. So arguably the importance of freedom of expression, particularly political expression, will allow the use of roads for reasons of protest. At the same time, it includes restrictions. One way of thinking about it is that you can use the road for the kinds of purposes for which everyone can use it, but you can't actually use the road to stop someone else from using the road. And so if you think about something like a blockade, where the point of it is to stop others from being able to use it, then that is not going to be allowable as a matter of public nuisance. Now there's an, a further question whether because of the importance of freedom of expression, this should be interpreted narrowly or broadly. My focus for right now is only on the structure of public nuisance. Standard remedy for a public nuisance is either an injunction or money damages. A money damage, in order to get money damages, you have to show what's called special damage that you suffered in a different way than everyone else. In addition, in order to get money damage, you need to show that there was an interference with your rights rather than with the rights of somebody else. And so a long line of cases says that if a public nuisance stops your customers from making it to your business premises, you can't recover, why? Because there has been no violation of your right to pass and repass on the road. On the other hand, if you think about the automakers in Windsor, they have actually had difficulty operating their factories because of the road being blocked as a result of which they were unable to use the road to transport things from one place to another. And so that would count as the relevant type of damage. The other remedy, as I said, is an injunction. The challenge with an injunctive remedy in something like the case of the protests in Ottawa is if, since the police have had, as of yesterday, not been enforcing all of the traffic regulations, it's difficult to imagine them enforcing an injunction. I'm out of time, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Over to you, Kent. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, 
I'll take a different, I guess, non-academic perspective to some of these issues. Uh, the first is, uh, I think what we've seen here is an intelligence failure. Uh, I have a post up on the Just Security website where I go through uh, a long line of Canada uh, uh, security institutions failing to take uh, far-right anti-government uh, terrorism uh, very seriously. We've seen this uh, in uh, a number of cases, Justin Burke, uh, the Quebec mosque shooting, uh, and the recent uh, case in London uh, with a man who was arrested adorned with swastikas. Um, so uh, this is something that I think Canada has a difficulty uh, dealing with, but I also think uh, that we have to make uh, be careful not to overreact and engage in the type of guilt by association that we saw uh, surrounding Islamic extremism in the wake of 9-11, which led to the Arar and other um, 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 cases. The second failure that we see is uh, a policing failure. And uh, in a forthcoming book uh, that I've written called Canadian Policing, uh, uh, Why and How It Must Change, uh, I trace a long line of what I call under governance of the police. So the Ottawa Police Service Board is actually the governor of the Ottawa Police. Uh, they have over 300 pages of policies on their website, but not one uh, dealing with uh, policing of Wellington Street and the Parliament Hill area. Uh, I noticed, and I've just gotten these in in the last few minutes, uh, the regulations for the DSA now uh, designate uh, the Parliament precinct as a protected place under the Emergency Act. And uh, listening in to the Ottawa Police Service Board yesterday, I was quite disturbed that they've not learned the lesson that Justice Warden emphasized after the G20, which is it's a mistake to say that the police, that the board has no uh, mandate to direct the police or to develop uh, 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 policies to govern police operations. So even under the existing uh, Ottawa Police Service Board policies, as inadequate as they are in not dealing with Parliament Hill, uh, this should have been seen as a major event, and there should have been a policy before the trucks got into town that was developed by both the police and the police service board. Uh, we've also had uh, a failure of leadership at the provincial level with the Solicitor General not clearly directing the OPP uh, about uh, what they should do. The third failure is a failure of the criminal code. The criminal code failure, if you go back, uh, the provisions dealing with riot, uh, including uh, the archaic provision of reading the riot act and uh, unlawful drilling and intimidating parliament, all offenses under the criminal code have been in the criminal code since 1892. And although uh, the British law uh, dealing with protests is not without its controversies, uh, one of the reasons why we have these policing failures is that Parliament has largely abdicated the responsibility for regulating police conduct. So even in 2021, Parliament responded in a typical piecemeal and ad hoc fashion by providing provisions about the concern du jour, uh, which was picketing hospitals and intimidating healthcare workers, but did not expand beyond that to have a modern law uh, to, uh, to uh, govern uh, uh, protest. And so one of the things that we've seen in the absence of modern law is government by injunction. And today the injunction against the honking has been extended by 60 days. Uh, we've seen in the context 
context of indigenous protests uh, in junctions with the recent ferry creek injunction being restored uh, by the British Columbia Court of Appeal with essentially uh, the court saying we're not going to worry about how the police enforce an anti-protest, anti-blockade injunction. Again, this leads to what's the central thesis of my new book is that there is a governance failure with respect to Canadian policing, one that is aggravated uh, by the federalism, a kind of deep federalism that concerns Canadian policing. Few recognize that Section 20 of the Emergencies Act does not allow the federal government to deputize either the Ottawa or the OPP police services and rather maintains their governance authority as perhaps inept as they were. And then finally, uh, where is this all going? Um, I'm not convinced that the Emergency Act, the declaration is going to solve this. Uh, I'm not convinced uh, that uh, the existing laws were inadequate as often. Uh, it's not the issue of the existence of laws, it's how they are enforced. Uh, and so unless the protesters uh, leave, uh, I think that we may require aid and civil power under Section 275 of the National Defense Act. And if that is used, that will require a request by the Ontario uh, uh, Provincial Attorney General, and it will put our former and current colleague, uh, Minister Anita Anand, in charge of the response. And again, uh, to me, this would represent uh, a crushing failure that, that uh, shows the intelligence failure, the policing failure, the governance failure, and the criminal code failure that have led us to uh, the story state in which we are in. Over to you, David. Thank you, Kent. Thank you to Dean Brunet and Brenda Kostman for organizing this, inviting me to speak to you for a short while about constitutional discourse. Um, the method I'm going to employ is a bit different from what my colleagues have been doing. It's just, more in the nature of a socio-legal analysis of the convoy's constitutional discourse and claims. Um, so freedom appears prevalent, right, in, in the constitutional discourse uh, in Ottawa and at border crossings. And what I want to underscore is how American political and constitutional discourse continues to impress itself on Canadian developments. Uh, given the dominance of US media politics and culture in Canadian circles, it comes as little surprise. In fact, I dedicated a book called Red, White and Kind of Blue to this very phenomenon. So this isn't a new thing, but it's taken on new dimensions in the context of a pandemic that's killed over 6 million people worldwide. So consider the word freedom. Uh, this is a key word in US constitutional history. The American Revolution was premised on a conception of freedom freedom from arbitrary and tyrannical government in London that justified the establishment of quote, free and independent states. Then there are, moving ahead through time, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's four freedoms, including among them freedom from fear and freedom from want, or the Freedom Summer of 1964, the voter registration drive by the civil rights movement and the American South, or the widespread use of freedom during the Cold War, which juxtaposed the free world uh, uh, as opposed to the communist one. So this rhetoric of freedom continually pops up in American constitutional and political history. It has become so prevalent, uh, particularly during the Cold War, writes uh, Daniel Rogers, that it binds together confusions and discordancies of American life and smooths, of course, all of them over. Now, one can identify the synonymous use of the word liberty in English constitutional thought and in Canadian, particularly during the two rebellions in Upper and Lower Canada. Freedom has not been an evolving keyword in Canada as it has been in American constitutional discourse taking on the proportions of a civic mantra. Rather, rather than invoking freedom, Canadians have preferred to emphasize deference to authority. Freedom wears a crown is the title of a popular monarchist tract. 
freedom gets converted in convoy discourse into rights claims and not just the charter, but a panoply of statutes and international declarations concerning war crimes or experiments on human beings. Speaking specifically of the charter, the convoy's leadership appears to believe that in their desire to be free, governments do not have any corresponding duty to, to protect Canadians from the turmoil associated with COVID. So all public health measures associated with combating COVID, vaccine passports, mandatory jabs, uh, uh, work masks, uh, fines for running afoul of provincial regulations, limit freedom and are therefore unconstitutional. So this is an absolutist rights discourse that's familiar to in some streams of American constitutional thought. And I think it's foreign to Canadian constitutional law. Now, I don't plan on outlining all of the charter arguments under Section 2B, freedom of expression that are available to the protesters. There's no question that this falls within the scope of constitutionally uh, protected expressive freedoms. Um, the question is whether it's a reasonable limit. And I, I think I can predict with some certainty that most, if not all judges, are, would be loath to declare uh, uh, these measures as unreasonable limits on uh, um, uh, public health uh, measures that are deemed necessary by governments acting on the advice of independent medical expert opinion. I'll leave aside the question of the uh, com compliance of the Emergencies Act, both with the terms of the Emergencies Act and the Charter for my colleague, uh, Professor Richard Stacey. Um, so uh, 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 it's noticeable, I think, that the convoy is not getting very good constitutional advice. So at a press conference the other day, Brian Peckford, one of the last surviving signatories to the Charter in 1981, uh, said that he did not believe Section 1 of the Charter, the Reasonable Limits Clause, would apply in these circumstances. It wasn't clear whether he was talking about the protest or the Emergencies Act. He would be wrong in either case. Um, and then he invoked the preamble to the Charter, uh, referring to the supremacy of God and the rule of law, playing to his audience at the press conference. Uh, we know that the Charter's preamble plays little or no role in Charter interpretation. Uh, what the constitutional claims uh, the convoy protesters are making reveals a freedom for the possessive individual, unencumbered by entanglements with others, disinterested in reciprocal relations of care. Uh, to paraphrase a book, uh, by Nat, Nat Hentoff of the Village Voice. Um, it's a freedom for me, but not for thee. Uh, the woeful lack of constitutional literacy is underscored by the Memorandum of Understanding or MOU that was drafted by the uh, group associated with the convoy called Canada Unity. Now this Memorandum of Understanding was withdrawn a week ago on February 8th. It was uh, uh, offered to uh, the relevant entity, entities, and that's a defined term in the MOU, in December. Uh, they withdrew it because they say the whole uh, uh, plan of action was misinterpreted. Their sole intention was to peacefully express their displeasure with COVID mandates and to express a desire to be free. But did attract 320,000 signature, signatures and had, was referred to by organizers. I think it's worth exploring a little bit. Um, the MOU begins fittingly with a quote from Thomas Jefferson, the Virginia slaveholder and author of the Declaration of Independence. The introduction to the MOU seeks to end, quote, discrimination and segregation, which ra resonates rather well in the American constitutional experience, and calls for the law to be returned to Ottawa. To that end, the MOU identifies three entities, three parties that would be signatories. The first, the people of Canada, represented by this group, Canada Unity. The second, the Canadian Senate, and the third, Governor General uh, Mary Simon. The MOU obliges these entities, once they sign on, to work together in the true spirit of partnership to instruct all levels of government to, quote, immediately cease and desist, cease and desist all COVID measures, uh, those I've mentioned, the, uh, the parties would undertake to uh, uh, issue cease and desist orders to respected honorable members of the government of Canada, the House of Commons and the Privy Council or cabinet, uh, in addition to premiers of the provinces, territories, mayors, municipal health officials, 
they're all, they all would be ordered to uh, stop unlawful activities that are uh, in violation of the rights instruments, the panoply of them that are mentioned. There's no valid legal authority identified in this MOU for the Senate and Governor General to impose their will on the House of Commons, on premiers, on uh, territorial leaders or in municipalities. Now the convoy leadership will be quick to tell us they're not lawyers, but they've occupied a chunk of downtown Ottawa for three weeks with the object of ignoring election results obtained uh, four months earlier. So it reveals not only a lack of knowledge, but a serious, serious deficiency in how constitutional government operates in Canada. When they announced withdrawal of the MOU as a basis for negotiations with the Governor General and the Senate, uh, the organizers declared they were firmly in support of the Constitution, they weren't wanting to overturn constitutional government, yet uh, their actions belie any respect for established political institutions, but uh, rather emphasize unelected ones, the Senate and the Governor General one belies any respect for downtown residents uh, in Ottawa, really belies respect for anyone but fellow travelers. Their behavior signals an indifference toward ordinary political processes and moves in the direction of anarchy. I listened into a Twitter conversation the other night, uh, no more healthcare, declared one convoy supporter. Uh, it'll be back to the farm. What about minimum wages or collecting taxes, one listener asked. We are the Tea Party, came the reply. We are doing God's work. Uh, if the object of the exercise was to get a message across, I think they've succeeded rather well. It's just that it's been, it's considered anathema to most Canadians uh, and to most truckers themselves. In fact, they've been granted far more solicitude uh, than APEC protesters, G20 protesters, Indigenous occupiers blocking access to indigenous lands. Louis Riel declared in 1869 that the people of the Northwest were, quote, free to adopt one form of government in preference to another. And for this, he was hanged for high treason. So we've, we're doing better than that. Authorities are better at tolerating political dissent today. But in this instance, the occupation and the constitutional argumentation are simply intolerable. Thank you. Wonderful. So last but certainly not least, Richard Stacy, um, the uh, topic that entered the scene in the last few days, uh, use of emergency powers. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks for thanks for having us and thanks for listening. Uh, I'd just like to talk very briefly about the rule of law and the implications that the invocation of an emergency has for the rule of law and whether there are any threats to the rule of law that recent events pose. <clears throat> I'll start by just outlining in very brief terms what the rule of law requires. Then I'll look at some of the uh, elements of the Emergencies Act and, and, and offer some thoughts as to what the threats to the rule of law might be. So first of all, you heard my, professor, uh, my colleague, Professor Schneiderman, talk a second ago about the importance of the rule of law to the Charter and to the Constitution. And it is indeed one of the fundamental principles on which the Canadian experiment in constitutional democracy rests. So what does it mean for a system to commit to the rule of law and for government officials to uphold the rule of law? A brief and working definition that we can proceed with on the basis of today is that the rule of law requires all exercises of public power by officials to be contemplated in rules that are set out publicly and beforehand. So what does that mean in, 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 in plain terms? It means that every exercise of power has to have its foundation in a statute that is publicly available and promulgated before any public exercises of power take place. Every decision by a government official, every exercise of power, whether it be the granting of a driver's license, uh, the permitting of a mine or a pipeline operation, or indeed in this case, <clears throat> executive orders or regulations purporting to the control of an emergency, have to be taken in terms of a statute. It is the statute that is the source of those powers, and it is the statute that sets the limits to those powers. Now, it's important to recognize that what's going on 
in 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 the declaration of a state of emergency as an is an invocation of a set of powers that have already been set out in the Emergencies Act itself. By complying with the limits that the Emergencies Act imposes and exercising the powers that are themselves set out in the Emergencies Act, the government would be upholding and committing to the rule of law. It's important to recognize that what's going on here is the government is not acting without lawful authority. It is not acting uh, 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 by decree, um, uh, making rules about what can happen in the face of this protest, it is acting as the Emergencies Act itself envisages. <clears throat> so how does the Emergencies Act control the use of public powers? It does so in three ways. The first is by defining the circumstances or the criteria that must be met in order for an emergency to be declared. That's in section three, I think, of the Emergencies Act. It also sets out the kinds of emergencies to which the government can respond, and importantly sets out in very clear and precise terms the kinds of orders that the government may make in order to respond to the emergency. The third thing, and this is perhaps the most important thing that I'll say today, is that the Emergency Act does not allow the suspension of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It does not allow the government to act in ways that would override the Charter. Quite the contrary, in the preamble to the Emergency Act, it is stated very clearly that all exercises of power conferred by the Emergency Act must uphold and comply with the Charter. And that's true for all legislation in Canada, and it's true for all exercises of public power. So a lot of the, the comments in the press have used the phrase sweeping powers. And the concern that, I, that I've uh, extracted from many of these press comments is that the government now has carte blanche to act as it wants to deal with the protesters. And that's just not true, because in all of its actions, the government will be constrained by the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, as it will be with exercises of power under any other statute in Canada. Now, if it's true that the Emergency Act sets the limits to the government's power, as well as providing the source for the government's powers in responding to emergencies, and it also says in quite plain terms that, that all government decisions must comply with the Charter, where are the threats to the rule of law? Are there in fact any threats to the rule of law? And I would suggest that there are. And I'll emphasize that the threats to the rule of law and the powers uh, utilized under the Emergency Act are no different to the threats to the rule of law that would arise with respect to the use of any other public powers conferred by statute. What is that problem? The problem is that the government may be exceeding the authority that the Emergency Act gives it in the first place. And there are a couple of ways that that might happen. The first is that the government has declared an emergency in a situation that may not rise to the threshold that the definition of emergency set out in the Act requires. That's a matter for debate. Uh, that's a matter for evidence. Uh, and that's not a matter to which I will devote a great deal of attention. The second area where I think there may be threats to the rule of law depends on what the specifics of the regulations that the government issues actually are. Now, as you heard my, my colleague Professor Roach say a second ago, he got the regulations in a few minutes ago. I believe these were issued late last night. I have not had an opportunity to study them closely, but here's where the focus will be. If the regulations and the orders that the government has made do in fact exceed the powers that the Emergency Act gives to the government, then those will be unlawful and those will constitute a threat to the rule of law. Why? Because the government will be acting in ways that the statute does not envisage. The government will be acting in the exercise or the purported exercise of powers that it does not actually have. The second concern is that, as you heard my colleague Professor Schneiderman say a second ago, there may be limitations on charter rights. Those limitations will have to be justified, will have to be justifiable. And the only place that we can decide if those limitations are justifiable is in the courts. And that will happen at some point later on in the future, no doubt. <clears throat> 
The precise area in which the threat to the rule of law arises is in the fact that what happens now may not be decided to be uh, uh, a contravention of the power set out in the Emergencies Act until courts have an opportunity to weigh in. So that brings me to, to the last thing that I'd like to say about the Emergencies Act, which is what are the mechanisms for oversight? Now, of course, the courts can always declare that an exercise of power by a government official is ultra vires or is unlawful. But of course, that requires litigation and that takes time. The threat to the rule of law is that the government will act in ways that the Emergencies Act does not contemplate. The damage will be done before the courts have an opportunity to intervene. The second role or the second area for oversight is through Parliament. The Emergencies Act requires that all that first of all, that the declaration of the state of emergency has to go before Parliament for confirmation within seven days. And secondly, that all orders, all specific orders issued by the government must be set before Parliament within two days. This is a minority government. Uh, it's a government which, uh, uh, sorry, it's a parliament which has shown itself willing to debate on important issues. And I have no reason to believe that Parliament won't be uh, a site for lively debate and oversight of the government's exercise of powers here. What remains to be seen is, uh, is what the specific content of these regulations are, uh, and at some point in the future, uh, uh, what the courts have to say about it. I'll end by saying two things. One, the possibility that the government will overreach uh, is one I'm not willing to discount. I just don't know based on the, on the regulations, which I haven't yet had an opportunity to look at. And the second point is to offer a little bit of perspective, including uh, including comparative perspectives. <clears throat> this is the first time in Canada that I have lived under a uh, federal state of emergency, but it's not the first time in my life. I come from South Africa, where uh, for a period when I was a child, uh, the entire country was under a state of emergency for a period of five years. That was during uh, opposition to the apartheid government, and the comparative perspective, and indeed the broader perspective that I want to bring is this. 8,000 people were uh, detained without trial in South Africa during that period, and many of them died in detention during the state of emergency. And I think it's important to maintain the perspective that that is unlikely to happen in Canada. And it's important to keep a little bit of perspective on precisely the limits of uh, the state of emergency in Canada today. And with that, I'll end. Fantastic. Thank you, Richards. I will now turn it over to Brenda Cosman, who will um, um, put some of the questions that we've received to the panel. And to the extent that you looked at the Q&A, some questions have already been answered in, in the Q&A, but um, there are some that we're going to put on the floor. Brenda. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for absolutely fascinating um, perspectives from so many different uh, legal angles. So the first question goes to uh, some of the constitutional scholars here. Um, to what degree does the law allow regulation of the exercise of the right to protest? Um, that is, you have the right to protest, but are subject to limitations on the forms, locations, manners in which those protests happen. Um, free speech zones, for example. So uh, maybe to David or maybe to Kent. Sure, I'm happy to talk about this just for a moment. Um, sure, there are there might be less restrictive alternatives if the authorities were to clamp down on that speech immediately, as happened in Quebec City or at APEC. They, they would put protesters far from the actual event, so could actually have no means of expressing their disagreement with the people participating in the event they were protesting. So not, not really very eff effective from a protester's point of view. But in terms of the limits that'll be placed on protest and dissent, uh, it's pretty clear that the convoys reached the limits, right, of what's tolerable. And I will point to the 2011 Occupy movement. We've got decisions in lower courts all over the country uh, where Occupy protesters um, were uh, booted out of their encampments in Toronto, for instance, at St. James Park. So they're in a, a park adjacent to St. James Church and were welcomed by the church. Um, 
were booted out after four weeks. So uh, we're on to three weeks now and a mu you know, much more of an inconvenience than dog walkers in St. James Park, who are the affected parties that Justice Brown referred to in booting them out of uh, the, the place they were occupying. So I think we've got jurisprudence that um, indicates that Okay, you can do this. In fact, you can stay for a while. Uh, it might not have, uh, court might not have agreed that the convoy could stay on Wellington Street, but nevertheless, you can stay a while in principle, but there comes a time in which you have to go home. And it seems to me that we've reached that point. The, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I would just add that the regulation that came down uh, uh, yesterday, 20, uh, 2022, 21, um, you know, reminds me of the debate we had over the Anti-Terrorism Act, where the issue of protecting critical infrastructure was one of the more contentious issues in the definition of terrorist activities. And so section two says a person uh, of this regulation that came down yesterday, a person may, must not participate in a public assembly that may reasonably be expected to lead to a breach of the peace. Uh, you know, so far so good. By A, the serious disruption of the movement of persons or goods or the serious interference with trade. I mean, that's something that probably would have gotten a rough ride in the post 9-11 debate that we had at this faculty. And it, it also, you know, goes to uh, kind of the real politique uh, of this is that we really saw uh, the OPP and Windsor uh, mobilize when, of course, the Ambassador Bridge, uh, you know, the key economic link uh, to the United States was cut off. And so again, I think it's important for those uh, of us who were there uh, in the 9-11 debates uh, to continue uh, the discourse that we have, because, you know, it seems to me at first blush, uh, defining interference with trade as a breach of peace uh, doesn't exactly fit together. And I think we have to be careful about uh, blending uh, um, uh, concepts. S uh, similarly, subsection B says the interference with the functioning of critical infrastructure uh, is a breach of peace. Uh, the interference with critical infrastructure is a harm. It's a harm that existing laws like the offense of mischief uh, uh, and others uh, deal with. Uh, but again, I'm not sure if that is by definition a breach of the peace. And if it is, I think, you know, we're into new ground. Terrific. Um, so we have a couple of questions about economic damages, um, and they go something like this. So is there a legal basis supporting those smaller business owners to sue the protesters to claim economic reimbursements or economic damages? Similarly, for trucking companies whose trucks or instruments get used um, by the employee in the protest. Uh, in other words, is there a way to hold um, the folks responsible for all of the economic damages uh, that they are causing? Um, and I'm gonna uh, toss that one to Professor Epstein. Thanks, Brenda. So the final formulation of, of the question, is there a way of holding them responsible for all of the damages is going to definitely get a negative answer, but there are some econ heads of economic mm -hmm. damage that are at least in principle recoverable. So the interim injunction granted with respect to the Ambassador Bridge actually raised two causes of action. One is public nuisance and the other is what's called the unlawful means tort. And in public nuisance, you can recover economic damages for economic loss in a different way than you do with most other torts. And most torts you recover for economic loss only if you suffer personal injury or property damage upon which those losses are consequential. On the other hand, if, as it was the case of the automobile manufacturers, you are unable to access a public road as a result of which you are unable to conduct your business, for example, with the Ambassador Bridge, any auto part crosses the bridge seven times in the process of production. And so there, it's an interference 
with a right to pass and repass on a public road. And there is, in principle, an action for the economic loss. Business owners in Ottawa are, I think, in a slightly trickier situation with respect to public nuisance because most of them are simply losing customers. And as I mentioned, for an action in public nuisance, it has to be your right to pass and repass on the public road that is interfered with rather than that of your customers. Now, the other tort that was raised in the Windsor Injunction that is the unlawful means tort potentially would extend even to that case. Basic structure of that, that this is a tort that developed in the 19th century when the leading case involved trading companies in the far reaches of British colonialism, actually shooting at people who were about to do business with their competitors, not hitting them, but scaring them off. And this is obviously an unlawful means, but it was not uh, tort directly against their competitors in terms of injuring them or damaging their property. It was rather an interference with their economic relations and was actionable. There is at least a potential case to be made that an attempt to create a blockade, the purpose of which is to inflict economic damage as a means towards achieving some further downstream political goal is going to fall within the ambit of the unlawful means tort. Whether it does or not is going to depend on all kinds of details that we don't presently have in front of us. But in principle, there could be recovery for many of those things, though how they would actually work. And it is going to depend. In terms of what happens to the owner of the truck whose truck is subject to civil forfeiture, I think Professor Katz might be more likely to be able to answer that than I can. I, that it's certainly true that if you use someone's property without their permission and it is destroyed, you uh, they obviously have a cause of action against you, whether there's a, a legal proceeding to prize them up, but I don't know quite what the structure would be. I'm sorry. Maybe I'll jump in on the, there's a, there's a bit of a contract question in here. Uh, at least it was posed as, um, you know, the trucking company whose trucks or instruments get used by the employee in the protest. If it really is an employee, um, then, then that you, you expect that that employer, the owner of the truck, has the capacity to say, "Hey, you're just not allowed to use the truck in this in this purpose," and that would be a violation of the employment contract. So the the consequences um, would include getting fired from that job. I suspect more of these are independent contractor type arrangements. I don't know a great deal about trucking contracts, um, although I did write a paper about contracts contract regu truck regulation uh, in grad school for some very bizarre reason. Um, uh, and, and there, I think we may see that there are, you know, kind of contracts where the, the, the driver is, uh, you know, basically has use of the truck, makes decisions about what, what routes to go on, when to be there. And, and I would just say part of the funding that we're seeing is, you know, uh, funding the capacity for those contracts uh, drivers uh, to continue to participate, uh, but I think you'd have to look at the contract and and uh, to determine if that was a breach of the contract provisions to be using the truck for this purpose rather than the probably intended purpose of transporting goods. Fantastic. Um, we have some absolutely fabulous questions. We're obviously not going to be able to get all of them. Um, this is, I think, again, back over maybe to the private law folks. Uh, is there a tort of assault that can be utilized with respect to the incessant use of truck horns? Chris? Oh, maybe not. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. Arthur might have a view about that. that um, I'll defer to him. It's so... It's going uh, there's a theoretical question and there's a litigation question. The litigation question's less interesting but easier to answer. I think the likelihood of anyone having a success uh, successfully identifying the assailant and showing that this was, say, physically damaging their eardrums or something is pretty much zero. 
whether there could be a cause of action for something like battery in cases in which there's no physical contact, I think is a hard question. I think there is, there's another tort of roughly intentional infliction of emotional distress that could potentially be available there. And there are also harassment torts that could potentially be available. I think turning a loud noise into a battery is a little bit more difficult to do. Great. Um, and maybe last, I don't, well, it depends how quick the, the answers are. Um, uh, Kent, I think this might be for you. So there was a question about what happens if the protesters don't abide by the injunction and uh, Professor Katz had responded that, well, they can be held in contempt. But the follow-up question was the police in Ottawa are refusing to enforce the injunction. So what happens if police don't enforce injunctions? Can they be held in contempt? Or what happens when police are just not, not doing the thing? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's an important question. Um, I mean, David Schneiderman and I, and I wrote something uh, uh, very critical of a judge who expressed impatience that the police were not immediately enforcing uh, an injunction against a rail blockade. I think where it ends up is that the police are under an obligation uh, eventually to enforce the injunction, but it is a matter of uh, police uh, discretion uh, 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 how and when uh, they will enforce the injunction. So the injunction says, you know, this should 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 uh, take place, but usually it is up to the police. And of course, the police have uh, lots of different duties here. They may have intelligence uh, about the presence of children, uh, the presence of arms, and so on uh, that the judge uh, does not have. So uh, I'm not aware of any case where police have been held in contempt for not enforcing an injunction. Uh, generally, uh, the court issues the injunction, and then they allow the police to exercise their discretion about how to enforce the injunction. And of course, the, the renewal of the anti-honking injunction today uh, comes, uh, admits, you know, media reports that, um, that people are still honking. They're not enforcing every uh, use of it. And, and again, that, that is, you know, very complex issues of police operations, public safety, police safety, in terms of actually enforcing the injunction or other parts of the law. Uh, let me just hand it back to Dean Brunet. Thank you so much, Brenda. So I want us to begin the closing remarks simply by saying thank you to all of my colleagues for this unbelievably rich um, discussion. This was just uh, fantastic and um, I've certainly learned a lot. I also, I was thrilled to see how many people uh, attended and also participated. So we received a, a large number of really great questions, um, some of which uh, we managed to get to, to the end. So this was, uh, this was uh, a, a great event. Thank you ev to everybody for making the time. Um, and um, We'll see how things develop, but uh, you know, I think everybody comes away with uh, um, new angles to think about something that is obviously a very complex situation. Thanks very much, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>